bill, kill the bill, kill the bill, kill the bill, yeah. was the goal from day one. Right. Um, right. But because of all of the efforts that many people in the community were putting forth to try to kill the bill, we definitely changed the bill. Mm -hmm. and the bill changed over time from the original version that was mm -hmm. dropped in the House to the Senate version. But we did get out, at the end of the day, a bill with some of the most unconstitutional, strikingly mm -hmm. um, unconstitutional provisions in it, which we can talk about more. Yep. But we had been working on a, prevent a potential legal challenge the whole time as we were trying to kill it to prevent us having to go to court. Because right. going to court is very inefficient. It is right. not the way to deal with these things. Right. Um, so uh, going to court was something that we were ready to do. Um, if, if the legislators didn't listen to the people of Jackson, which is people in Jackson were very clear about how they felt about these bills, mm -hmm. um, legislators didn't listen, so court was the only alternative we were left with. So for those people who you know, may not have been paying attention to the intricacies of this bill, you know, there were several changes. Even when I had Senator Wiggins and Trey Lamar in here on the show, they even talked about some of the changes that were made uh, in the uh, judi Judiciary Committee. Um, and you guys were instrumental in, in helping to make those things happen. So talk a little bit about from the inception and the introduction of this bill, talk about some of the changes that you guys were able to actually see in the bill before uh, it reached Tate Reeves' desk. So one of the most one of the most shocking aspects of the original version of the bill that Trey Lamar dropped in, in House Bill 1020 was the creation of a triple sized um, CCID, which is complex, um, capital complex improvement district. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll just, just, just zoom out. What is the CCID? So in 2017, it was created essentially, you know, a few blocks around the downtown area mm -hmm. to um, uh, create, um, uh, uh, to focus on infrastructure Infrastr improvement, right. like flower beds, pine straw, yes. you know, yeah. put in, I think there were some segues. There was like, you know, this idea that let's put some of, you know, the, the wealth that's in Jackson, put it into a little fund and just kind of concentrate a little bit on mm -hmm. downtown. Um, what that ended up being was like really a tool for um, trying to like occupy, um, you know, through Trey Lamar's bill, a huge swath of Jackson that included 80% of all white people in Jackson. Mm -hmm. So it um, scooped up this huge swath of Jackson and then tried to install an independent floating court system that was just state controlled. So judges appointed by our white chief justice. Um, prosecutors appointed by our um, white attorney general, Lynn Fitch. Um, and then they were, those courts were supposed to have jurisdiction over any lawsuit that the state was a defendant in. So if you wanted to sue the state for a bill or for, um, uh, you know, injury that happened to you um, and you wanted to go to court, you couldn't go to Hines County elected judges anymore. You had to go to state court appointed judges. Mm -hmm. That part of it, that you have to go to the state court appointed judges to sue the state for violating your rights, right. um, did get stripped out. Okay. Okay. So that was one of the most important things that got stripped out. Um, and also, um, we you know, essentially took it from multiple CCID courts um, down to one. Yeah. Um, which we maintain is still unconstitutional. So I would say um, we are suing about the same things, about about certain similar similar things about harm and what's unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. But the version of it was kind of a, a huge, monstrous, like you know, multi-armed monster in the first version, mm -hmm. and we did get it slimmed down a little bit more. But um, there, there's still a very similar uh, constitutional harm. So the contention is, uh, and, and at crux with this issue, the contention from those people who are in support of this bill, uh, they say that you know nothing is getting done about crime. At least this is something that we can look to as a solution since there have not been any solutions. Why don't the people of Jackson want anything done about crime? Why don't black people want anything done about crime? Why are these people so in favor of lawlessness and criminality? Uh, if you are against crime in the city of Jackson, you should just, uh, you know, blindly go ahead 
and accept this bill and say this is what we need to do and this is our solution. So for those people that say, hey, I'd like to do something about crime in the city of Jackson, <clears throat> which is literally everybody in the city, explain to them why this is not the best solution to go about doing it. I think that um, Ann Saunders, who is the named plaintiff in this lawsuit, mm -hmm. um, she lives in Jackson along with Dorothy Triplett and Sabrina Sharif. Those mm -hmm. are three Jackson re residents who brought this suit. And something that um, um, Ann said is, it is deeply offensive to her, the idea that this is being done for her own good. Mm -hmm. as, as a black woman, she has, um, you know, been steeped in the, the, the stories and the, 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 the uh, you're rolling out day-to-day uh, -day life of like the civil rights movement in mm -hmm. Jackson. And for somebody to tell her that this is for your own good and this is for your safety, she says, how is it safe for you to dilute the rights that people died to give me? How is it safe for you to take away my responsibility and my ability as a person with the wisdom and experience in this area, take it away from me to solve the problems in my community mm -hmm. and give it to you who live hours away and have nothing to do with my community. Mm -hmm. um, also, creating a state-appointed court system in violation of the state constitution is not related to safety. That's related to, to hijacking other people's voting rights. Mm -hmm. It just, there is no rational relationship to safety. Um, similarly, appointing Hines County judges, appointing four circuit court judges, which HB 1020 does, when we elect four, and when the state constitution says circuit court judges shall be elected, does not do anything to, to promote safety. Right. It simply dilutes the voting rights and the, the power of people in Jackson to um, elect people to decide, um, um, you know, the rights around property and life or death. Mm -hmm. Circuit court judges can decide whether people live or die. That's mm -hmm. the truth of it. Everywhere else in the state, the Constitution allows them to be, says they shall be elected and they are elected, but now in Hines County there aren't. Those things don't have anything to do with safety. There are people in the community, especially in the Jackson Undivided Coalition, organizations that have been working for years on issues mm -hmm. of safety. And they go out like People's Advocacy Institute. They go out into the community and pound the pavement. Jackson People's Assembly, come to the floor. Mm -hmm. Tell us what the safety issues are in your community and what would help you feel more safe and what people, I've been to many of these meetings, I've been going to many of these meetings, as I said, as a resident and both as mm -hmm. an advocate, mm -hmm. and people say, what makes you feel safe? Think of the last time you felt safe. What did it mean? Mm -hmm. It means people having the resources that they otherwise would have had the state not been for decades mm -hmm. sabotaging the city. Right. So it's resources they are entitled to, not resources that anybody's asking for. Resources they're entitled to, to invest in their communities according to the ways that people say they need it. People say they need, um, you know, the ability to have, you know, credit, there's a credible messenger program. Yes. You know, so yes. people who have the experience being able to go out and do mentorship stuff. There's a violence interruption program. Mm -hmm. Is there an alternative for when there's going to be a violent conflict rather than calling the police? It's mental health resources. Mm -hmm. It's doing like, you know, offering people like housing like opportunities, mm -hmm. um, reentry opportunities. So these are solutions that people in the community have identified that they need to address violence. Mm -hmm. And the people who created 1020 never asked anybody, as far as we can tell. Right. What are the resources that you actually need? And nobody said a state-run court mm -hmm. that we have ever heard of. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, you know, during, when they were defending this bill, none of the people, none of the legislators who were asked who suggested this solution, this proposed solution mm -hmm. um, to violence, nobody could articulate what data they relied on, what people they had spoken to that were mm -hmm. from Jackson. Mm -hmm. So it seems very, um, that's the kind of evidence that courts and even in people, everyday people say, this looks really suspect to me that mm -hmm. the things you're saying you're doing, the reasons you say you're doing this, mm -hmm. aren't the reasons that you're doing it. Right, right. So clearly, uh, you know, a majority of Jacksonians were not talked to. Uh, you know, even when I had, you know, Trey Lamar and, and Bryce Wiggins on the show, you know, it, it was a clear, it was clear that there was a sample size that they used, uh, a control group that they used to talk mm -hmm. to. I live in 39211. I live technically inside the CCID. There were many people in my neighborhood and neighbors of mine who were against this bill, not against crime, 
Uh, they were all, I mean, I mean, not against fighting crime. Uh, all of them were aware and all of them were cognizant of the fact that we needed to do something about crime, but did not feel that this is a solution, a solution. But if I could talk to Paloma, the citizen as well, you say you live in the city of Jackson. So the proponents of this bill say, we're going to add more judges. And more judges is going to help us to be able to clear this docket. We have a docket where we have criminals in Hines County who are being let back out in the street. Uh, to become repeat offenders. We have criminals in Hines County who have not been able to see a judge. We have a docket that is backed up a mile long. We have to be able to get the wheels of justice turning so that we can get these people through the system. And this for us is a better way to expedite that problem. Uh, what do you say to those? I think those are all, those, those, I have heard those, as many people have heard those issues about what's going on in, uh, with regards to crime rate in Hines County. Mm -hmm. People have quoted those issues for many, many, many times. Mm -hmm. It was very revealing during the Senate um, uh, questioning of Bryce Wiggins when people came with data mm -hmm. and asked him, what data are you relying on when you talk about the overcrowded docket? What data are you relying on when you say these appointed judges have been moving things along? And when other people, and this is a, you know, um, people and folks came up with very um, telling data and shared it with a news organization, so I know that it's been out there. These appointed judges who've been appointed for the last year or two have moved almost no cases. Right. So the idea that there's somehow this, um, uh, <laughs> I was just gonna say, <laughs> inappropriate. Right. The idea that they are this amazing, shiny solution right. is fabrication. Right. So, like, here's what I think. The emperor has no clothes uh. with regards to these appointed judges. Yeah. They are not moving cases. They are not working full time. Mm -hmm. um, there's, they um, actually have, they don't have the courtroom space to actually move more cases. So right. they just haven't been really moving more cases. Right. So the idea that appointed judges are going to help address a black law right now is just not the case. They ha and how do we know that? Because they haven't been. Right. Again, how do we know it won't help? Because it hasn't been helping. Right. So when you talk to the DA, when you talk to um, you know law enforcement. You know, there's all kinds of finger pointing about what's going on, but lots, everybody agrees the crime lab is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. And the crime lab is run by the Department of Public Safety, which has gotten tens of millions of dollars to pour into Capitol Police. Well, one of the biggest issues with why people are not moving through the criminal legal system is because they're waiting on evidence to come back, like mm -hmm. 6, 9, 12, 14, 16 months. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but I do want to just confront this issue of we have a lot of crime in Jackson because people are getting let out, repeating it. People mm -hmm. are getting let out. Come back. I don't think the data is there on that. Right. I honestly don't. Right. Um, that's something that I know that the police chief has um, repeatedly said mm -hmm. that we need a municipal jail mm -hmm. because people, it's this catch and release. Mm -hmm. That is not established that that's happening nor that that's leading to more crime right. and the relationship between misdemeanor misdemeanor offended de defendants offense offenders and people who commit felonies is also just not established here so right. i think we need to be really suspicious of um answers that sound like they're based on data and that aren't and bryce right. wiggins was forced during the questioning of the senate to say he had no data he had only anecdotal data so we got the answers about why is this? And the reason is he's heard stories. That's what anecdotal data is. <laughs> uh, yes, he's he's heard stories of you know friends and people who visited the city of Jackson who said they were scared to come downtown and they were scared to go here and scared to go there. These are <clears throat> anecdotal. Uh, as a person that you know loves to look at data and analyze data, I would love to see actual data and actual percentages where these things are true. I think what happened was is that, you know, narratives were painted and have been painted about the city of Jackson and they were able to really push this bill through based upon, you know, the narratives that have been created about this. Of course, if you want to talk about crime statistics, 
you know, those things, you can sit those things to the side if you want to talk about murders, you know, of course the news has been keeping up with the number of murders that we've had in the city of Jackson. Uh, you know, I would love for JPD to go back to, you know, giving us the Comstat report every week. I would love for that. You know, data is a very important thing. But also we have to be realistic about solutions to this crime problem that we have here. We have to be, you know, really goal oriented and solution oriented and not try to police ourselves and also litigate ourselves out of this issue. And I think that's what's happening. As it relates to uh, the Capital City Police having this expanded jurisdiction, uh, how are y'all addressing this in this lawsuit as well? So the lawsuit we just filed does not address expanded jurisdiction. However, the NAACP filed a lawsuit, I think about maybe a week and a half ago, mm -hmm. that addresses the issue of expanded jurisdiction. Um, and I can just say generally that lawsuit um, tells the story of the a similar story that we're telling about, you know, appointed judges, unlawfully appointed judges, unlawfully um, designed uh, CCID court, and then expanded jurisdiction of the Capitol Police, all from the lens of a 14th Amendment intentional racial discrimination lens. Mm -hmm. So um, while it's their case, I will just say, um, you know, they're telling the story of how this is um, majority white lawmakers who are um, targeting a majority black, black-led mm -hmm. city um, for deprivation of equal protection okay. under the law um, based on um, a racial animus, which is just this idea that you don't deserve the same rights that we have because you're black as opposed to white. And that's that's addressed in that lawsuit. And I that is, I, to me, that is, you know, we have a police force in Jackson. Yes. There, one of the things that is really frustrating about being at this litigation stage is we're forced to talk about why other people's solutions are improper, bad, harmful. Right. But as you said, we really need to be always spending our, we need to be spending our time talking about what we need and what we want. Right. And I don't want to be in a position where I'm like defending like my family and at Thanksgiving, right. <laughs> I'm like, you can't, I, you and I, like I have all my beef too, but you can't talk yes. to my boy like that. Right. Like it's like this real sense of like, you know, we need to talk like with love, respect, understanding and push like our lawmakers, our decision makers to better reflect our, our shared values. Mm -hmm. But it's so hard to do when you're just, when you're just holding off attacks from the outside. Right. So we're holding up attacks on the outside and saying Capitol right. Police do not hold the solution. Right. They are not locally controlled. Right. We are at the mercy of Sean Tyndall mm -hmm. when we try to, who is a white, like executive level lawmaker that has no accountability to people in Jackson. Right. And now we have this highly militarized police force in the Capitol Police that where the way I have heard it said is, with Capitol Police, nobody can hear you scream. Like, mm -hmm. we have no feedback loop for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, I understand that we need to have, I, we have sued the J Jackson police force mm -hmm. for unconstitutional policing. So yes. I'm not saying that what we have right now in the Jackson police force is adequate. Mm -hmm. And I think many residents have a lot of feedback about why the Jackson police force isn't adequate. So that is a conversation that actually needs to be productively had that we're mm -hmm. putting, we always have to put off because we're trying to say, no, Capitol Police Force is gonna make things worse. Right, and, and I think that's fair because, you know, the Jackson Police Department is not without their problems and not without their faults. And, and you know, as you said, you guys have, have uh, sued them before. Uh, I, and, you know, just looking already, we have a couple of cases against the Capitol City Police already as it stands for brutality. Uh, and what's not happening here is is there are no voices of the people on the ground in Jackson, Mississippi. This is basically saying that you guys are not smart enough uh -huh. to take care of yourselves and you're not smart enough to figure out these problems and these solutions to crime on your own, even though we know that the police force here is, you know, uh, you know well below what it needs to be. It's, it's criminally understaffed almost, uh, that's a solution. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be, you know, fixed to try to get this to where it needs to be. So, you know, when we're talking about litigation and we're talking about this, this suit being filed, what are the steps? What are the processes for people that are listening right now that, you know, know that HB 1020 has been signed? You know, what happens next? And, you know, does this hold up the bill? Does this prevent the bill from, I think, I think in July it's supposed to take effect? Does this pre prevent this bill from taking place? You know, how does this work? So um, we have filed, after we filed the lawsuit, a couple days later, we filed what's called a motion for a preliminary injunction. The preliminary injunction is asking the court to temporarily 
hold the law off from taking to effect until we can have the whole trial on whether or not it violates the, the Constitution, which can take a while. Mm -hmm. So then at the end of that, we're asked, we would ask for a permanent injunction, which strike the law down from ever taking effect. But we have a hearing, or at least a status conference. We have a, a, a we have an appearance in court next week okay. on our um, motion for a preliminary injunction. We may need to work out more things before we actually get that big hearing. We're gonna see basically what happens, but we have asked for that to happen on an expedited basis. So we should know within the next like week or two what's going on with the motion for the preliminary injunction. Okay, and then uh, if this holds up this particular bill, uh, what is, what's the recourse uh, from there? If this bill gets held up, is there the possibility that they'll have to come back to the table to create something else? I mean, what happens if this bill is not in place and or it's being held up, or if there's an injunction to permanently hold up, hold it up, you know, what do the people and the citizens of the city of Jackson and Hines County particularly, you know, what's our next course of action from there? So right now the lawsuit is in the Chancery Court. If the Chancery Court agrees with us that this law is not constitutional or that it's very likely to be not constitutional and temporarily at least holds it off or permanently does, the state has an appeal. The appeal is to the state, the Mississippi Supreme Court. Mm. What is probably potentially unprecedented, if not that extraordinarily rare, is that our the first defendant in our lawsuit is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court because he is the one that's empowered with the sole authority to appoint four Jackson Circuit Court judges and the CCID judges. Mm -hmm. So he's the defendant and his court is going to be ultimately ruling on the constitutionality under this the Mississippi State Constitution of this law. So um, that is the next um, you know, two steps is the Chancery Court's got to decide and then either side, the losing side, has the option to appeal to the Mississippi Supreme Court. So that's going to be a two-step process that's going to play out over the next couple months. Now, if I'm not mistaken, is there another lawsuit that has been filed uh, against House Bill 1020? Are you familiar with that? Yes. So the, 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 um, the NAACP has also filed a lawsuit, and that one also includes the expansion okay. of the CCID, and that one is in federal court, and we'll actually, um, uh, the Mississippi Center for Justice will actually be filing a federal lawsuit pretty soon on the First Amendment aspects, um, the First Amendment problems of 2343, because the um, legislature, it, you, it's a, it was a provision that was in 1020, the legislature is saying, you have to tell uh, Sean Tyndall mm -hmm. or Bo Lucky, who's the chief of police, mm -hmm. anytime you want to have any event outside any Protest property occupied. State yeah. Property, yeah. yeah, on mm -hmm. your state property, which is a violation of the First Amendment. Exactly. And if you wanted to fight that, you would actually have to fight the very people that you know you would be. It's it's crazy. It's a it's a it's a double edged sword, and it's yeah. really kind of like they're trying to stack the deck. But yeah. you know, uh, we definitely uh, are glad that you guys have brought this lawsuit forth. At least those of us who know that this is not the total solution. Uh, definitely want to have you guys back on as this begins to, you know, to roll through. So I think it's very important and what we like to do on the show is to give our listeners information so that they can have the correct information and, you know, not happenstance, not by chance. You know, you're giving us the nuts and the bolts of this particular lawsuit and how it's going to work. And the goal is hopefully to hold up House Bill 1020 so that it does not take effect uh, in July and then we'll work towards another solution from there. And hopefully... Uh, it is my hope and my dream that we can actually get back to the table and actually have a real comprehensive, fair conversation on House Bill 1020 and get all of the people in the room, get citizens in the room, get all the legislators in the room and actually have a conversation and a compromise on what's going to work because everybody wants an end to uh, the rise in crime. Everybody wants these numbers to go down. Everyone wants a safe city of Jackson. We just have to agree on what that method is going to be. And House Bill 1020 definitely is not it on its face. Uh, so we're going to see what happens with this lawsuit coming up. So Paloma Wu with the Mississippi Center for Justice, uh, they have filed a lawsuit uh, fighting House Bill 1020. 
We're going to keep up with it. You guys make sure you stay tuned to Good Things Jackson, and we'll let you guys know how this lawsuit is going. Uh, make sure you spread the word, let people know. Uh, there's a possibility that there's still some help on the horizon. Even though the bill has been signed into law, we've got a chance that, you know, some things might be able to change. And I, for one,